I'm Michelle Balatico Hayes from the Technology Tech Meetup, and thank you so much for coming um, to visit with us about the AWS um, mobile services. And um, I'll introduce Tom Dow. He's actually the East Side Android um, developer organizer. So we'll just go ahead and kick it off. Yeah, hello. Thanks, Michelle. Um, yeah, my name is Thomas Dow. Um, I'm the organizer for the Eastside Android Developers Meetup group. So this is our actually first meetup, and I'm cool. happy to see everyone came and braved the code to come out here. Thank you. I um, want to thank uh, T-Mobile for letting us use their facilities, and most of all, um, Janash for coming out from Amazon um, to speak today. So uh, he's got a great presentation, and I hope you uh, enjoy it. So I'm going to let him start. Sure. So. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Hello, everybody, um, and thank you, Tom, for this is our this is the first kickoff event. So it's pretty cool, and more, more and lots of more uh, Android uh, meetings coming up. So thank you, Tom, for getting the community built in. Um, I'm Janesh. I'm one of the technology evangelists at AWS. Um, I have been at AWS almost eight years, uh, right from the start when we launched our, uh, our first service, Amazon S3. Uh, and uh, I've, I've, so feel free to ask me any questions related to AWS. However, today's presentation is more focused on you know, uh, uh, mobile and Android and uh, AWS mobile services that we launched uh, a few months ago, uh, as well as new updates that we did last uh, in two weeks. So we are going to see a complete application, how you could build uh, in a more effective way. How many people are Android developers? All. Oh, oh there's just three people in Android? <laughs> that's, that's cool, okay. So uh, iOS developers? Okay, few. Cool. Uh, and uh, how many people know about AWS? Okay, great. A lot of people. Nice. How many people know about AWS mobile services? One, two. Okay. Very cool. Awesome. So let's do this. Um, what we are going to do, let's make this interactive. I love to you know, answer questions as they come. But we have, some, uh, we have a hard stop at 7.45 because I think... Um, the security needs the parking. Uh, par uh, the parking garage is going to get, get closed. So 7:45, we'll have to, to rush so that they can get out uh, by 8 o'clock. So we'll, we are, we're going to try. I have two hours worth of content. I have six demos that I want to show. I hope I can go through all of these. But basically, this is a technical presentation where I like to go dive deep a little bit more wherever I can. And you know, feel free to ask me any questions you like. Uh, during that. So how do you build a mobile app today? What are the different ways uh, people are building mobile app? And what are the different ways people are building a mobile cloud-powered app? And um, so more and more devices are building, uh, are getting uh, no, shipped today. Each, how many people have more than one device today? Almost everybody. So and when, when we have two or more devices per person, you know, or when you, you as an application developer building and working with a mobile app, uh, when, when there are more devices per person, you want to, the obvious place to do stuff and store stuff will be in the cloud. So we want to, you know, as we build and, uh, the, the low-powered constrained devices you know, connecting uh, not only the smartphones, but also the next generation of connected products and devices and in the Internet of Things, you, know, you want to really leverage the power of the cloud uh, in order to really take a maximum benefit of all the different services. So as you're building more mo mobile applications, you're either building you know, in Android or iOS or you know, Fire OS or other application development platforms, but you know, we want to really focus on what are the different you know, basic table stakes of any single, every, any single app, right? What are some of the apps uh, the, that, that, are, that are really you know, some of the basic things that you, are, you, know, you have to do in order to, to, to make a really good mobile application? Whether you are building a mobile game or whether you are building a you know, real healthcare application on mobile or you are focusing on any of the mobile applications. Now, one of the basic tenets of what 
Amazon Web Services mobile services uh, focuses on is the fact that you know you don't have you can you can focus more on the things that matter to you rather than really worry, worrying about you know the, the the basic things that are not really adding any differentiated value to your app so one of the things which i like to talk about when i when i talk to mobile application developers i i ask them two questions one what is the most unique thing for your app what makes your app unique that's number one. Give me a list of things, and people come up with saying, you know, the the user experience, the application itself, where I can, you know, I I, I actually drive value uh, of, or it's a healthcare app or something. And then I ask the second question: Is that where do you spend your most time on? And they come up with a list of saying, you know, scalability, uh, synchronization, data synchronization between the devices, you know, uh, access and authorization to the cloud, you know, sending push notifications and, and managing the push notifications gateway and so forth. You know, and those are some of the things that are really not adding any differentiated value to their app. They come up with those, those as a list. So my goal, ultimate goal, is that, you know, I want that what the list that you are that makes you unique your app unique should be the same as where you spend maximum time on so your both these questions at, you know, should basically be just the same answer like the, the same list should come up that i'm spending more time on what matters to me the most so these are some of the basic things that you have to do today what i call table stakes or what i call jobs to be done right uh, basically you know, you want to authenticate users across different, uh, you know, when you're using a mobile app and you're powered by the cloud, you want to authenticate those users, whether it's Facebook, Google Plus, or, uh, or Amazon, or, you know, or, or your own authentication username and password. So that's a basic thing that anybody wants to do. You want to authorize access. You want to see these people only have access to this part of the cloud and they don't have access to these other, other parts of the cloud, or you can manage those effectively. You want to synchronize your data across multiple devices so your user experience is much more effective. You don't want you know, your users to basically you know, continuously work with you know, you know, uh, you know, unsynchronized data. If you pick up, uh, 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 um, no, uh, if you're playing a game, you want to basically, you know, start, and you reach a particular level, you want to start and reach at, you know, when you and start another device, you want to you know, pick up from where you have left off, right? Uh, if you're reading a book uh, on, uh, on your device, on, on your laptop maybe, and you want to, again, you know, you know, pick up from where you're left off, and so your data should be synchronized, your user preferences should be synchronized, and so forth. So one, th these are basic things about building an app. Once you build your app and you are, your app is basically shipped on the App Store and they, they are out there, you, know, you want to know more about your users. You want to know how your users are performing. You want to know, you, know, the, you want to analyze your user behavior and find out those patterns, your retention, your run campaigns to basically drive more revenue to your app and basically bring and de develop more applications, uh, develop more strategies so that you can increase your revenue and increase your engagement of your users itself. So you want to track those, analyze those, and so forth. Likewise, if you have a user-generated app, uh, no, user-generated data, uh, like you know, you're building a media-generated uh, me media application, or you're building an application that that needs a lot of you know, audio, video, or, or images, or building a photo sharing app like Instagram, you want to you want to store lots of media right from your mobile device. You don't want you know to run a massive cluster of servers to just you know build this app. You want to build this application in a more effective way. So you want to deliver media to the app. If you're building a video app where, let's say, you're building ABC uh, app for mobile app for ABC, or you're building a Netflix itself, right? You want to deliver the media right to your mobile device and 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 uh, or, or building whatever you like. Right? You want to engage your users when they're not using your app. For so example, send push notifications so you can you know, drive more engagement and, inc and, and, make, and, and bring them back to the app when they're not using it so you, they can be more effective. 
You want to show, store shared data, so things like, you know, if, uh, to basically get the network effect that if I'm playing a game, I want to know what are the high scores of a game and so forth. So I want to know how many people are playing, uh, have reached what levels, and so forth, right? And in the last but not the least, it, 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 the world where we are going into more and more real-time data, we want to get results and data more effectively. So you want to see how you can actually stream real-time media, uh, real-time data directly from the device without really having to have any server whatsoever. So. My goal with AWS Mobile Services today is the fact that I'm going to walk you through all of these without having to have a single server at the backend infrastructure. You can basically build an app by using all the different, all these table stakes, basic things that, that, that are important for any app to be there to, to the basic functionality. You can build out all these functionality without really having any backend infrastructure, or what I call you know, serverless infrastructure. Um, so, on July 10th, uh, AWS launched a complete suite of mobile services. These are, you know, uh, in, the, in the last eight years that I've been at AWS, we have you know, now uh, 48 different services, but like there are different services as you most, most of you already know. You know there is, um, how many people know about Amazon EC2? Okay, S3. Cool, right? So those are some of our raw primitive building block services, right? So those are compute, storage, network, database. We have, you know, we have a relational database service. We have a data warehousing service. We have you know, um, um, you know, several different you know, uh, load, uh, load balancing service and uh, uh, compute storage and, 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 uh, and other networking services like VPC and so forth. These are our raw building block services. On top of that, we build you know, some mobile optimized services that makes it easier for the previous slide that I made earlier, you know, how it makes it easier for them to actually use these services and without having to really worry about any servers to manage or without having to you know, worry about scale. And most importantly, really not have to worry about velocity of scale. Scale is, is definitely important. Right? So you can throw a bunch of servers and you can scale. But how quickly you can scale is also extremely important in the matter of days, in the matter of minutes. So, it's so you, can, you, can, you never lose your particular customer. So all these services that I talk, I'll talk about in detail a bit, uh, Amazon Cognito, Amazon Mobile Analytics, Amazon Simple Notification Service, and so forth, are built from the ground up for, you know, from, from a mobile uh, 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 opt um, developer that, that basically have. Each, everything in AWS has an API, everything is pay as you go, and everything scales inherently and available in multiple parts of the region, uh, multiple regions. So this is right now, you know, um, you know, just a way to kind of, uh, you know, kind of all the different mobile services that are available. So the previous slide that you show, uh, that I showed you earlier, uh, that you know, authenticating users and, and authorizing users, as well as all the different ways, these are basic table stakes of any app. You could do so using all these different services that I, that I talked about er, uh, in, earlier. I'm going to go very quickly on, on these as well um, overall. On July, uh, on, on July 10th, we released our main service, but on one of my favorite services that we launched two weeks ago at, at AWS reInvent is uh, Lambda. How many people know about Lambda? Oh, just a few people. I thought people might know. Uh, so this is our um, new addition to our you know, compute service offering. It's not just limited to mobile, uh, but it has the mobile use case as well, that you can run stateless cloud functions without having to run a single server or even have to manage that. So I'm going to show a cool demo on that one as well. I, I love that because it has you know, all the different functionality that you need to run a backend infrastructure. Uh, without, again, managing servers back end and so forth. Uh, so I'm going to talk about that one as well a bit. Uh, so let's see what, what does these mean, right? These are all cross-platform um, services optimized for mobile. Amazon Cognito is our you know, data synchronization and user identity service. Uh, Amazon Mobile Analytics is a service which allows you to see all the you know, collect and analyze user behavior data with just simply one line of code, and I'm going to show you that too. 
Amazon you know, uh, simple notification service with the mobile push is a cross-platform you know, uh, uh, intermediary service which allows you to send push notifications across Google, Apple, uh, APNS, Windows, other you know, notification services with just one single endpoint. So you can, you can uh, manage that more effectively and not having to manage the complete push notification gateway for you. And, and then in addition to the mobile connected off uh, mobile optimized services, we have these different connectors that make it extremely easy for, um, uh, to build an app directly from the mobile device connecting to our highly abstracted services. So you can run basically you know, the mobile app is, is directly storing data to Amazon DynamoDB, which is our you know, fast NoSQL uh, you know, distributed database. Uh, without having to worry about again any servers and so forth. Likewise, you know, if you're storing large amounts of media, you know, you can directly you know, have your mobile app directly store data to Amazon S3, new, not having you having to have a complete web server backend and so forth. So you build your infrastructure without having to worry about you know, any any backend infrastructure as well. So we have built these optimized connectors uh, right in our mobile SDK. And there are two types of, and these are native SDKs. You know, Android SDK is, is the one that I will be showing today, uh, but there are other SDKs as well, like Xamarin and others, that will make it easier for you to build, uh, you know, whether you are building an iOS application or an Android application or you know, any other mobile application as well, or a mobile web application, I mean. Uh, these mobile SDKs are basically native they, they work, uh, they are simple modular f um, files, so you can pick and choose the services that you would like and make your footprint, you know, your app footprint uh, smaller. And also, you know, they are, they are designed to work with the local environment, right? For example, in Android, it uses the shared preferences and uses a SQLite, it manages the caching, it manages the intermittent connectivity, uh, so you will, uh, you will not have to worry about all that in, in, in your application development. So these are native SDKs that, that directly work uh, on uh, no, simple jar files in case of Android uh, that you can Im in embed and, and add all this functionality with it. Any questions about this? Yes? Do you support Windows? I'm sorry? Do you support, do you support Windows Phone? Uh, currently, the .NET SDK is what, where we are going to work on this one. We don't support Windows at this time, uh, but we have Android, iOS, Fire OS, and, um, and JavaScript applications right now built in. But we have a .NET SDK that a lot of developers have started building, uh, Windows uh, phone application as well. So, so let's go quickly on each one of these. I'm going to show you a small little game that I built called the Snake Game. Most of you might already know, uh, and kind of walk you through this whole process as well. As time permits, I'm going to show you a demo on that front as well. Uh, so without any further ado, let's see each of these table stakes environment and running, running in a more effective way of how you can do this. So first step is authenticating users. So any application today needs to authenticate your users. So if the first step you want to know is how do, how do you really authenticate and, and you know, whether you are building your own, you know, uh, having your own username or password uh, to, to authenticate or you're using a public identity provider like Google Plus, social or Facebook uh, uh, or login with Amazon and so forth. So Amazon Cognito basically is three things. Question, sir. Will be yes, all slides will be available. This, I think this is recorded as well, so you'll get all the video as well, too. Uh, these slides will be available on SlideShare slash Amazon Web Services. And I'll post it to the Perfect. So um, uh, what I was saying, Amazon Cognito is our data synchronization service. Uh, we, we found out early on, and a lot of feedback from our developers in the community that that it is very difficult to build a highly scalable synchronization infrastructure when you want to synchronize data across multiple devices of the same user. 
So you want to really manage an effective way of, of you know, managing single key value data store around uh, for, your, for your user. So Amazon Cognito is a data synchronization. And think of this as a cloud save directly from your mobile device, your data that you can syn synchronize across devices. It also is an identity broker service. So whether you're using Google Plus or Amazon or any authentication provider, you or even any open, open, uh, uh, open um, ID Connect provider, you can, you can use this uh, you know, identity broker and bring your focus back to your users rather than your, your login provider. So you, as a user, you care about you know, your users rather than which login provider they use. Uh, you want mo most of the users, uh, most of the login providers. And this actually allows you to even merge uh, credentials across as well. So we integrate. Um, uh, we support all these out of the box, and we also support your own username and password if you if you have so. You will authenticate. I'm sure I'll talk about that. And last but not the least, is the implementing the security best practices. Now, how many people are Android developers again? Okay, maybe some of you can say, uh, or even other application developers too, embedding credentials into your app. How many people do that today? Oh, no, awesome. You're great best practices guys. That's very cool. I've not seen uh, more people um, uh, no, uh, do this because the pr problem is one of the most, I would say, anti-patterns or the, you know, uh, uh, it, it's a wrongdoing is that they embed AWS, uh, made an embed credentials into the app. And you can, and any Android developer knows that they can simply extract the APK file, the and you know, and get the credentials, and then that's your keys to the castle. So you never want to embed credentials in your app. And so what Cognito does is creates a temporary temporary least privileged credentials that are not never stored into into the into the device. It only stores the ID. So it creates and it gives you 15 minute uh, credentials so you can access the cloud during that time. And then, then that is automatically refreshed as you need it. And so you, it's, a, it's a highly good, um, best practices given way to access any cloud service of AWS from directly from the device itself. So this is uh, Cognito now becomes sort of the gateway to any AWS service that you would like to have access to. So let's go a little bit more deeper into each of these. As I said, Amazon is an identity. Amazon Cognito is an identity broker service. Uh, so it supports multiple login providers. It brings the focus back to the users. Joe, no, Anna is or what you really care about, right? It it gives focus back to, instead of you know, multiple devices. It focuses again more on users itself. So you have. Whether you are user, your device, your user is using five devices or 100, you know, your, their data is synchronized, and you can create great user experiences on that. And then it can connect to any of the AWS mobile services you know, because it's a highly secure way to connect uh, without storing and embedding AWS credentials right in your app. Secondly, one of the most important things about, uh, about Cognito is that it, uh, it allows you to uh, provide guest access. So sometimes a lot of different apps today uh, don't want an overhead for their users to log in. And they want to log in only after they have reached a certain stage of their game or their app usage and so forth. So in that case, it's very important that you can you know, zip, your users can zip through the app, you know, start using the app without having to log in, and then later on, they actually log in and, and you, know, you can convert and make them as paid users or whatever you want to do. So Cognito does this in a more you know, in a secure way. So you can you know, access your, your guest users can also access the same cloud services. And then once they log in, they can do all the other cool things around it. So, so it's, it's a great way to, to, to kind of you know, do this too. One of the things that I really like that this it's the unique identifier that we create. Cognito creates a unique identifier, a, a simple GUID, and stores that in the native as the na native uh, location that will 
that will allow you to basically, this is an abstracted ID that, that is stored across, uh, in, uh, um, across the different login providers. And we match it on the client side and on the server side, which login provider is connected to that, that particular ID. So we can sync that users and your identity right to, to you as well. So it's a unique identifier that we create for that particular user. And that's how we basically manage all the different providers together. So how do you get started? And I'm going to show you quickly on, on these ones as well. So start, getting started with Cognito is basically you know, three steps. You go to the AWS Management Console. You start up uh, you know, the, man, the identity pool. So let me just kind of go this uh, simple step and show you how it will, is going to done. So AWS, yeah, if you have an AWS um, account, how many people have an AWS account? A few, quite a few, good. If you don't have an AWS account, please do make one because it's, it's no charge unless you actually start using the service. And I don't have internet connectivity. Should I try the Wi-Fi? It worked. Okay. So you sign into the console and you can go to the AWS um, uh, mobile services. You go Amazon Cognito. So I have different um, no, identities already created. But if you are creating a new identity, the first step within Amazon Cognito is to create an identity pool. Identity pool is nothing but a pool of identities that share the same credentials, uh, sorry, the same uh, access credentials. Uh, so in this case, I will probably like, you know, create you know, a, a snake game that I'm going to um, you know, create. In here, I can actually specify my Amazon app ID or the you know, Google Plus log, uh, app ID or a client ID or the Facebook app ID, the app ID that you create when you create an app on the Facebook side and because if you decide to use your Facebook login uh, or, or Google Plus login and so forth. I'm just going to, uh, here also of course you can connect any open ID connect token uh, providers as well. Um, and if you have your own username and password, and you would like to still, you, know, you would like to use Cognito as a as a way to synchronize your data, you can authenticate using your own username and password. And I'm going to talk about that too. But you can put your developer name as well. And then last but not the least, I talked about the unauthenticated identities or what we call the guest user access. You can create that. I'm going to just enable that uh, for now. But basically, one simple step. And then second step is where you really specify what this particular identity of users and what access do they have. Um, how many people know about identity and access management for AWS? OK, few. So identity and access management is basically a complete, it's a free service with AWS that allows you to give granular, fine-grained access to every single resource and every single service across regions or in a particular region. So it gives you the access saying, Bob, and you know, these types of group of users that have the same part as, as Bob has access to this particular bucket in S3, and they can only access from this IP address uh, and only access this part of the uh, of the of the AWS um, users. They have access to delete, but they don't have access to creation, creating a new bucket or storing a new data. So you can do all sorts of permutations and combinations on you know, giving really good fine-grained access control using the IAM policies and, and roles. So in this, when you create an Amazon Cognito identity pool, you have to basically say a trust policy, uh, give a trust policy, and you give um, an identity policy. So in this case here, you've, you pro you're providing you know, what this access has. By default, you know, we provide uh, a simple access policy which looks something like this. This is the default uh, combination. So this user has access to Cognito Sync, or creating Cognito Sync service uh, no, users, and it has access to mobile analytics to put data into the events. 
Just like if you want to add access to S3, you say S3 star and you follow the convention, or you say S3, that particular bucket or an object, and I'm going to talk about that one in a little bit more detail in a few slides. But basically you create a simple um, role, um, and then, um, and then I and then start that start uh, implementing your mobile app uh, SDK. So download the SDK and then few, run few lines of code. And I'm going to show you in an actual game setup how it will work. So here is where you focus on whether if you're running an Android app or an iOS app. Of course, in this case, Android. You know, you you do three things. One is initialize the Cognito client in your SDK, and then you do a sync client, and then basically just one simple one line of code that basically does data set dot synchronize. This is a code, one line of code that does conflict resolution. It does uh, you know, basically working with the local cache, you know, caching architecture. It synchronizes your data that you need to synchronize across different you know, devices for that particular user. It does all these things in just one line of code. So let's see in a sort of a game setup, how will this work? So now I, now I have created basically a simple, so you can see I have a snake game login, which is one of the uh, single identity pool that I've created. And you can see a, a dashboard of number of users. So not many people are obviously using my game because it's just me and my friends. Uh, but basically identities, and this is a simple view of, of how it will look. Right? So you see uh, there are people who have unauthenticated, there are people who have Facebook. I have implemented all the three because it's so easy to do so in, all, uh, in, in using the Cognito client. And then basically you are creating, you, know, you see how many people are logging in, and then how you can do a lot of analytics on that one as well. <coughs> any questions? Yes, sir. Are there any enterprise integrations? Like Excellent question. Um, uh, right now, so the question is, are there any way we can do enterprise integration like you know, SAML 2.0 or LDAP or Active Directory and others? Right now, no, but uh, we are actively working on it. We'd love to get your feedback on what is more priority, more important, and we'd love to you know, learn a little bit more. But this is, uh, it, it's, uh, it's, um, Cognito is designed to work with any open ID connect token provider, and also you know, it basically has to federate. So you can do identity federation, and it provides you the mechanism to do so. Uh, using IAM. Today IAM currently already provides SAML 2.0, LDAP, and other uh, uh, integration points. And there are several different partners as well that, that like Secure Auth and Ping Identity and Okta and other partners that actually you know, do that for you in a more easier setup. So if, they, if you have that um, integration, that is much more easier to do. Great, great, great question, by the way. So let's see a simple um, element. So this was just basically a, a way. So now I'm going to kind of walk you through. Uh, no, after I go into the authorization, I'll show you my demo. But basically, uh, actually, why don't we go now? Let's just see the demo. So this is a simple Android application that that walk that that when you create file new Android, and then I started from scratch the entire thing. And I'm going to show you uh, the game first, and then walk you through uh, different um, you know, elements of the game itself. And it, as you can see, it's just a few lines of code, not so much uh, to there, but it's still fun to really play this. And it's, uh, trust me, it's addictive as Flappy Birds can get. So I will, <laughs> I will try to um, show you the game first. So it's an Android game. I have integrated Google+, Amazon, and uh, Facebook with just a few lines of code. And then um, the, the, the actual game controller logic is all based on very simple you know, game that we know uh, have played for. Our, it's a snake game. Snake eats the apple. Snake, as the snake eats the apple, the snake gets longer and more windy. And um, as and when you, know, you, you eat, the number of apples, and you reach a particular level, um, uh, you reach a particular level, the number of apples increase, and it gets tougher and tougher and faster and faster. So, uh, so it gets very difficult for you to play the game, and, and uh, no, you, you go ahead uh, with the game. So let's just see the game. I hope the sound works. Uh, 
because I have sound for graphics as well. So this is cool. Um, so far the demo gods are working with me. So this is a simple game. So like the snake eats the apple, I have a swipe listener that is listening to my swipes. I have sound too, that's kind of cool. So as you can see, the, the, um, the apple, now it gets, and the best part is when the game is over. Kind of cool, huh? So basically, it's a simple game. And now I'm going to kind of wipe all the data just so that you know, so I can you know, kind of show you you know how the apple increase, how the number of apples increase per every single game, and then and the level increases as well, right? So I'm going to just simulate here and um, you know clear all the data of this game. Start the game again. So in this case, I'm using the unauthenticated IDs. I'm not logging in with any per credentials. It directly zipped through the game without having to log in. All right, and then I log in, and I will see. Oh, I'm lucky. Look at the game. Apple is just next to. Okay. Oh, it's great to work with. Uh, play a game on stage. So as you can see, now I've reached level two, and um, I have a Fibonacci sequence of the apple. So as as the number of level increases, this is the second level. So now. The level finished, level two is finished, starting level three, and you can see the little toast coming up at the, at the game itself. Oh. Ah, got it, okay. So anyway, I'm now going to let the snake die. I've reached a certain level. I always love the trombone song. Uh, but, uh, so I'm going to sync the game. In this case, I'm manually syncing it. But you can obviously you know, run that in the background, or you can you know, just uh, force sync it uh, in your game itself. But basically, what I did here is, I am uh, it when when it started the game, and it, the first thing it did, it asked Cognito, "Give me a unique identifier." It then take the unique identifier that is basically used across different login providers. Right now, I'm not using any login providers. But if I, if I have to, I will, no, I will just start the game again. I hope uh, you can see in that small screen as well. It's pretty. So I log in on Facebook this time. Everybody close your eyes, I'm going to type up my password. Okay, it was fast enough. <laughs> so now I'm logging in through Facebook, and it, what it has done, it has merged my, my playing credentials. Like I reached a certain level, it merged their credentials, it associated the Facebook app along to my unique identifier that I'd created on the server side, on the client side, and I know that what level I am now in. Now when I log in with any other device, uh, and uh, on, on, on and start this particular game and log in with Facebook, it will bring back that data set and then you know, synchronize that data with that, with that element and then, and, uh, and then I'll start with the game a level that I have stored, uh, that I, started, I played earlier, right? So in this case, you know, I'll just uh, you know, start the game. So here, as you can see, it started off from game level three itself. So it started off because it knew what that level is. Now I'm going to log out, right? And I'm going to wipe. I'm going to wipe off the data just to kind of simulate the synchronization, right? Like, uh, so in this case, I'm going to clear all the data. This is basically a brand new app. I'm going to maybe like you know kill kill this emulator as well, and then start a new emulator, and then just to kind of simulate a new device, basically that it is a brand new device, brand new emulator, brand new everything, and I'm going to start this again. And when I log in with Facebook this time, it should start back with the if the demo gods work with me, uh, it will it is going to uh, uh, start with that same level, which was level three where I reached uh, earlier. Oop. 
sometimes Android emulators are pretty slow. Hmm. Let's just do it again. So I'm using the hacks uh, Intel uh, Atom um, processor because it's much more faster to start an emulator. Just a quick kind of best practice I love rather than using the ARM version. So if you install hacks and if you use a Mac, uh, install the hacks version of the uh, small little utility that you have to install and it will, the emulator comes up really, really quickly. There's always been a pain when you are developing. So now you can see I'm uploading the APK file. I'm going to log in with Facebook. So it's again asking me because it's a brand new device. So it obviously now when I start the game, it starts from game level three. Oh yeah, sorry, it just ref didn't refresh the particular screen. But basically it, start, it started with game level three uh, and has two apples, it's a Fibonacci sequence. So as you can see, you know, what I did was I am able to synchronize without any server side code, able to synchronize my game, my, my game state across different devices for that particular user. So let's see the game code itself, just so that we make it a little bit more interesting. And this, all this code is also available on GitHub, so you can you know, feel free to, to download and play with this as well. What this does is, is basically, if you can see the game, um, so for those who are Android um, no, um, experts, will probably grab this game in a, in a matter of seconds, because it's nothing but few lines of code. So here, there is a game uh, controller, so there's a basic things, all the, the game related logic is under the game folder, which has basically game controller, the snake, you know, pojo, the direction of the game, I have a swipe listener, which basically swipes right, left, and center, uh, sorry, right, left, up and down. I have a game view and a game state listener. Game state listener is basically just listening to my, my game controller and makes the game more faster and more difficult later on. As, as the game uh, um, progresses. And all the AWS related elements, I've integrated all the AWS services with, with, with in, in this particular game. So it's using obviously Amazon Cognito for identity broker service uh, for Amazon, Google, Facebook, and, and, and uh, no, uh, login providers. It uses, it uses Amazon Cognito for synchronization of the game state itself, as I showed. It, state, it stores game level and the game score. When, which was two parameters that I would like to synchronize, right? And then all I'm doing here and, um, is that I'm initializing the Cognito ca ca caching um, uh, provider. So it's, if you can see here, so Cognito caching provider, uh, these are the things that I got from the console that I, uh, console walkthrough that I did with basically creating an identity pool, creating certain elements, right? And then I am initializing the Cognito sync manager and then that is only the code that I need to actually initialize the constructor. And then in my Cognito sync, I'm adding one line of code which says dataset.synchronize. So on game startup, synchronize my data. And on game, on any level complete, put the data, like the, my level and my score and everything that I need, all back into the game, uh, back into the sync store. Now any device picks up that that the Cognito data set, it will, it will, it will synchronize that data for, for it. It always works with the local caching. So all it's, 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 a, it's using the local SQLite caching architecture first because it's using the native SDK. And then with data set that's synchronized, it's synchronizing with the cloud. The one, of most, one of the most important elements here is that when you start building the synchronization infrastructure, you will quickly realize that it is a very difficult uh, element, when two devices are trying to synchronize and put data into a same element, conflicts can occur, right? So you want, to, you want to make sure that there are some ways you can resolve those conflicts. And Amazon Incognito does all that for you, basically. We build, uh, we have last right wins, 
So we will you know, automatically decide which you need. But if that is not the, the game or the functionality that you really need, then you can overwrite that entire functionality, write your own com conflict algorithm, conflict resolution algorithm by overriding a simple callback. So in this case, I have a simple callback, and I can, you know, I can uh, basically say what I want in, that, in this uh, in this uh, callback that I want to define. And my entire constructor, entire callback can define my own conflict resolution. So this was just one of the example of how a game can use conflict resolution. Again, uh, sorry, Cognito. It's, it's not limited to any, just a game, but it's any app, any mobile app, that, without any server-side infrastructure, again. Any questions about this? Great, no questions. Actually, I'll give you one. Yes, please. On, on the guest user, uh, do guest users from different devices synchronize, or is it just once you apply that? Uh, Great question. So guest users do not get synchronized when uh, uh, ju just uh, because we don't know who, the, who that particular user is. Only when you are associating with a public identity provider or your own username and password that you have associated your, that app ID with the, with, the, uh, with, with the unique ID that Amazon Cognito creates, you know, that's when we know this is this user and we can synchronize that data across. Excellent question, excellent question. Any other question? Yes, sir. Yeah, so this is one of the most important questions that everybody has and in, in case of environment uh, in, in when you are storing any data. This is, a comp you know, uh, this is one of the most important elements that I focused on from a security perspective also because personally I'm very, I'm, I'm very interested in, in maintaining and managing the data. And when you're storing data in somebody else's you know, infrastructure, you want to make sure that it is securely kept and so forth. Everything that I talked about here uh, is, uh, is basically HTTPS, SSL encrypted, and you can encrypt your own data and the keys that you can manage, you can store that and, and you can manage the, uh, you, either you have Amazon manage the keys or you can manage the keys of the encryption. This is just bag, for, bag of bits for us. So you, you manage the encryption on your side and you can then store that on S3 and DynamoDB and other, other elements as well. Uh, so this is extremely important. Now there are other ways in which, the, from a security perspective, you know we don't want even the you know, credentials to be given away. So because it is you know, least privilege, you know, and I'll show, I will actually talk about security in a in few more slides as well. Uh, that you, know, you provide you know, granular fine grained access control on every single element. Whether you want the, you know, this particular user to access this part of the cloud in different way, and I'll show you that in a few examples that I have. Then, and it, it's extremely important for every customer that we have. You know, there are customers today, like uh, most highly security conscious organizations use the cloud because they have the flexibility of, of storing and managing the data that they need in a more effective way by storing and managing the credentials as well as you know, encrypting the data that they need. Encrypting the data in transit, encrypting the data at rest. Right? So those are the different protocols and practices that we follow today. In addition to the, the developer-oriented best practices that are there on security, there are, you know, um, there is, there is a, probably um, a, a ton of different related content on, on our website that focuses on how, our, how we make sure that our infrastructure is secure. So from SOC 1, 2 compliance to PCI compliance to HIPAA compliance, you know, how do we manage our infrastructure so your application can be compliant on top? Whether you're building and storing credit card data or you're storing PHI information or you're storing you know, uh, very important data that, that is related to you, you know, which we, you know, there are industry standard specification that all these regions, all this infrastructure is currently compliant to. So you can go through our security center which basically walks you through all the different protocols and uh, ways. So there are three ways I look at the security side. One is there are things that we have to wor work on our infrastructure from a compliance perspective and, and the industry specifications. And there are certain things that you have to do to, to make sure that your app is secure itself and your data is secure. So you have to encrypt your data in REST, encrypt your data in transit, and all the different best practices that you have to follow. And together, by following these two, you know, your app will be much more secure. Does that answer your question? Cool. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, 
so question on the uh, analytics. Uh, so what kind of uh, analytics data do I see when I use the Actually, uh, I've not even covered analytics. So stay there. I have a lot, okay. of, lot of different information on that one. Okay. Good question, though. Uh, can you authenticate with two different providers? Of course. Of course, exactly. That's the beauty of Cognito, that you can, your users um, can choose Facebook one time and then they use Google at another time. And in order for them to, in order for us to know that is the same user, they have to log in to, uh, log in on one device with at least once with those two login providers. And then we know that they can log in with any providers. So we associated on the client side and server side. So how this works is very simple. Let me kind of walk you through. This will also help some of the security questions that came up. So uh, your application, your mobile app, is going to integrate with the Amazon mobile, uh, AWS mobile SDK for Android, and then you know, call a login function. In this case, we are using the local you know, Facebook SDK and the Google Plus SDK and the login with Amazon, and they provide an OpenID Connect token. Um, this token is basically sent to the, along with the pool ID, uh, identity pool ID that you created on the console, and then uses the identity broker service, which, cre which then sends the temporary credentials that is needed uh, in that particular request. And these are least privileged 15 minute, interval, 15 minute uh, validation that you get this gun. And then once you get this access, now, you are basically you know, defined by your access control policy which services they have access to. So in this case, I had access to Cognito Sync. I had access to mobile analytics. So they can access right from the mobile device directly that particular infrastructure service that they need, any service that they, they, are, they choose to do so. I love S3 in this case because it's obviously if I'm building a media app like Netflix and I want to synchronize my movie, right, uh, uh, because you want to know, um, no, you want to pick up from where you have left off from, from in your movie, then you can you know, build that kind of infrastructure in, in, in an app without really having any server-side code. So um, on the developer authenticated identities, most of the users, you know, we talked to customers that we talked to, you know, they wanted to really focus on, like, they, they said, I don't use Facebook, Google, or Amazon as my login provider. I have my own username and password. I have managed my own username and database or authentication system. So Cognito works off of that one as well. In that case, obviously, you as, a, as an authentication provider you know, validate that user, and then you provide implicit trust to basically that particular user. And once they log in you know, on the server side, there's a server side code which basically says, OK, I have validated this user. You know, give them an open ID uh, style connect token. And then that is being used basically to, to pass in uh, for that, con uh, for that um, particular user as well. And it works exactly the same way. Yes, sir. The pool which we create is specific to the application, not to the user, right? Great, great, great question. Um, no. So the pool that you create, it can span across multiple applications. Okay. And that's the beauty. And if I have an example right next over here, which will ex actually come, come to that. Basically, you can span identity pools across applications. Not across the users. Um, let's say I develop an application, it is used by like 10 users. So if I have to control the services of individual user base, how do I do that? Not through the uh, pool, right? You, not through, because you can create either identity, uh, and I, I so each identity pool has basically a role attached to it. And each role has a policy attached to it. So you can say these group of users have only these access policies in there, right? And then you can, are you going after that route or? No, users in the sense, not actual the application users, right? You, you mean developers? Mm, okay. Sorry. Um, I was talking about the application users, not, not the developers actually. Correct, users, that's what I'm talking about, the user. So you can define identity pools across applications, and your this identity pool is basically a pool of users that are, that are there. Either, and you can define those users that you like. You can create multiple identity pools per app, if you like. So, so the data model kind of works very simple here, that 
each account can create multiple identity pool. Each pool has multiple that same the, that share the same trust policy. And each identity pool has basically authenticated identities and unauthenticated identities. Each of these are connected to an IAM role. A role is basically saying what part of the cloud they have access to. Um, and then each of these have access policies that I want only get access and delete access and not you know, you know, publish access and everything that you, you can define in that one as well. This is an example of a policy, right? As I showed you in uh, my earlier example, this is giving an, a, a user uh, or a group of users that has that, that I am role saying that has access to S3, has access to DynamoDB, and has access to Cognito Sync. Likewise, you know, you can give more granular policy restrictions that not only just this particular user has access to S3, but only that part of the bucket. And they can only upload photos to this part of the bucket rather than you know, uploading photos to uh, every bucket or, 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 or delete access and so forth. So by default, you always want to not have delete access, but you want to give upload access to a particular you know, part of the bucket uh, for that particular user. So you can define your you know, nomenclature as well. And then most importantly, you can do policy variables. So in this case, uh, you, know, you can go even more deeper fine-grained access control saying that you know, only this particular identity, only the particular user has access to this particular you know, part of the S3 bucket. Right? Instead, saying the entire role of the entire group that has the user access, you can say only the identity has access to the, the bucket that he has created, the, the role that the, the, the tables in DynamoDB and so forth. So you can define those access policy using those policy variables as well. So you are authorizing your access in that one too. So I already covered synchronization. Um, so let me just skip this part. So in this case, um, you, you can do either game state synchronization, which I showed you. you know, so you are synchronizing game state. But the most important element is that uh, you can also do uh, bridge the world of web with the mobile. And um, this is mo the most interesting element that, that you are watching a particular uh, you know, video on the web and you want to create an experience of the same user, I mean, start, start, starting the same you know, video right on your mobile device as well. Or you're watching an article, or reading an article on WSJ or something, and then you want to see the same article you know, on, on your device as well. So creating those types of experiences, or what the world now calls second screen experiences, right, are very um, interesting to create because here, uh, in this case, you know, it's a unique identifier across the web and the mobile world, right? So think of this as like a, a browser cookie that works on the web and the mobile world itself. So it creates a very powerful way to create you know, these web, that application that span the web and the mobile world that creates more if, a, a, an environment. And I have an example to show here as well. But before I go in, you know, this is, these are some real world case studies, right? So concrete games or concrete software you know, uses Cognito uh, across their different game develop, game development, ga uh, gaming uh, company uh, provide just for, um, for one reason, because it securely gives access to Amazon S3. So you can, you don't have, they never have to embed any credentials to store any data, or they, they, they're they using Cognito to basically you know, you know, get temporary credentials to this. So they're they are running these games, um, and they have uh, some very powerful games, uh, which I, I can't remember now, but they have a few really cool game um, assets that are there that, that uh, currently run these today. So I already covered you know, conflict resolution, intelligent sync. You know, they're fast. It always works with the offline mode. Uh, uh, so, and, it, and then later synchronizes the data when the connectivity is available as well. Um, so this was your example of uh, the identity pool. Um, so let's say this is an example where say this particular developer has two apps. One is the game, and another one is a productivity app. Your identity pool can span across multiple apps. So let's say in this case, you know, 
uh, they are only one of the apps is uh, one of the identity pool is just going to you know synchronize um, uh, no, the user preferences data set. So when it says user preferences, it's things like, you know, you go into right click and like basically kind of settings and say turn on push notifications are off, right? You know, if you're a news application, you want to know what your preferences are for a particular topic, right? Like you like politics more than, you know, entertainment or whatever. So you can, those are user preferences. And then game state. So in this case, the data set and the identity pool are basically, these two apps are basic sharing two different data sets. And you can build those complex sets also in a, and synchronize your data if that way. Each account has multiple identity pools. Each identity pool has you know, multiple identities. And each identity has basically mul one or more data sets. And data sets are key value pairs that is basically synchronized. That's the top level object that is getting synchronized across devices. Any questions? All right. So as I showed you already in, in the code, but this is kind of on the slide, now three steps. Now initialize the constructor, open the data set, or create, and then just write one more line of code in Android, set data set does synchronize um, in, in this. So I showed you how we can do. Yes, sir. Question. I was wondering if that key value here is, uh, would you do your own object serialization if it was complex data? Great question. So, um, the for us, you can either store you no know, key values data data set um, in the matter of you no know, key and value, key and value, and you do you manage those keys or you can, you can store the entire you know, JSON blob of your own structure that you have in one of the keys and then store that and, and, and manage the structure that you like, right? So it, it, it will always synchronize the entire data set and it will manage the conflict resolution. So there are pluses and minuses. If you're using key value individually of every row, we will do the conflict resolution ourselves. So we know which, which, which data was written at what, which line item was written at what time, which one is the most recent version, and will conflict resolution. But if you're use, managing your own blob of content, and you can store your entire blob of 20 MB uh, or so in, in the entire one single file as well. So you can do that too. But that's an option. Some customers actually like that because they would like to, they already are doing it, and they won't want to synchronize the entire blob of JSON data. We are working on binary data as well. So if you can do synchronization of binary data, that will be also one of the ways you can do. So just a few days ago, uh, actually a few uh, weeks ago, we launched uh, JavaScript Sync, so which basically uses the SQL light in the browser uh, and our browser SDK uh, that is that is no, that will use SQLite and using HTML5 framework to to synchronize your game assets. So this is uh, sorry, not game assets. Your any 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 user preferences. So the, if you're building a web mobile app or you're building an Android app with a web backend, you can basically create a unique identity across web and mobile. So one of the customers that I I worked with, you know, they are. Uh, an advertising uh, company. So your users, you know, when they are watch, you know, seeing a particular ad on the web, they want to make sure that they also see the same ad on the mobile phone. So they create these unique experiences, multiple impressions, increased revenue, and it creates a great way for them to, to, to engage more users and show the same ad and, and con convert them to more paid customers. So that's a great way, because it creates a unique identifier, you can basically use this in more effective way. So here, uh, I covered basically authenticating, authorizing, synchronization, and now let's talk about analytics, which was your question as well. Once you build your app, you want to make sure, you know, in the case of an app, in, in the mobile world, you work with app stores. You give your file to the app store, and then you basically don't have the visibility into how your apps are being performed, uh, or how your users are using your app, how, how the users are you know, interacting with your app, and so forth. And so if we want to, you know, in a recent survey they, they did, you know, I think, this, I, I totally believe this too, that, that 
user analytics is one of the most powerful and the most important aspects that developers should understand because it tells you more about your customer. It tells you about your, how they are using it, what are the patterns they are using it, and so forth. So um, there are lots of different mobile analytics uh, you know, providers and services out there, but the, the thing which makes it this differentiating part that, that we designed from the ground up was that, that we want these results in minutes, not in days or in, you know, in uh, hours and so forth. So at the, at the same time, you know, the data that you collect is your data. That, and you should be able to interact with the data the way you like it. Uh, and, uh, and you should be able to export the data. You should be able to, you know, and, and your data should not be you know, sold, aggregated, and, and others uh, are, are reused again in, in different ways. Um, so that, with that basic premise in mind, we design Amazon Mobile Analytics. Analytics. And, and Mobile Analytics is very important uh, <coughs> from multiple angles because it tells you more about your user. It has to be fast. Your, your, from the data that, that we receive, you know, we aggregate the data, we, we, we do the trending analysis, and we, you know, we, we manage. You should be able to see the reports and your dashboard within minutes. So, and of course, it should scale no matter what you do. And it has to be sort of free because you don't want to pay for uh, analytics in a way that, that is going to be more, cost of, uh, more expensive to you. And you own your data going forward. Mobile analytics, it actually you can see in the smaller screen here. Uh, so everybody move that side. Um, but get, getting started with mobile analytics is even more simpler. Literally just one line of code that you have to add on mobile analytics saying that start mobile analytics service uh, and, and in case of Android, just when the app is suspended or it goes back in the background, it will push the mobile, it will push the events uh, the events that you are collecting, then it automatically collects the session data. So things like active data, active user, daily active users, monthly active users, you know, the key business metrics that you really care about your app is all of those collected in, in, in one single, um, it's not working. Okay, there you go. So mobile analytics takes that, all that data and that makes it available basically to you within minutes. So you know, to answer your question, what type of data is available uh, within that 60 minutes or less time frame? Right? Uh, in this case, you, know, you can see things like monthly active users, daily active users, all the things that you really care about for a mobile app. Now, you new users, your sessions, sticky factor is how many people are coming back uh, from your month, month over month and day over day. And um, rent retention analysis, so you can do basically you know, how many, if you're running a particular campaign, for example, and you want to see how many people who logged in you know, a week earlier have logged in back and so forth. So you can see all this, you can filter it. Again, it's cross-platform, so you can see Android and, app and iOS and other platforms. And then you can filter via date and see lifetime value. And if you're tracking revenue, you can also track revenue and, and other, uh, other elements also. And uh, one of the most important elements is, is retention. Because you want to know how your users are performing and how are they coming back and when are they coming back. So as an example here, I had, you know, User retention is, is sort of uh, a very important outcome for your marketing campaign. So we ran a marketing campaign, new users that logged in were 1,087. Out of that, on the next day, no, no, 131 users came back. Out of that, on the day three, no, out of these 131, 104 came back. So how you can, what is your effectiveness of a marketing campaign can be, can kind of be measured using these analysis as well. And, and one of my favorite features is really you know, taking it to that next level that, that it's not just the session events that you care about, not just the you know, simple business metrics that care about, but you want to really you know, measure custom to your app itself. What part of the app is being used? What, what element of the part is not being used so you can create a better user experience and then change the user experience so forth later on, right? So mobile analytics has a service called 
uh, as, a, as a mechanism to collect custom events. So in this case, you define your attributes, your metrics, your, your, your event data, and then you say, if, let's say you are a uh, game, and you want to know how many people leased level seven, but they're not able to move to level eight. So you can capture all that data, and then basically get that information, uh, know, and, and render that information in a few minutes, basically, and then create a way to, so that you know more about your application users itself. Right? And defining basically, yes, question. Great question. Right now, it's more focused on um, on more on the app developer side. Uh, it's not for marketing managers. But let, hold on to that one. Hold on to that thought. I will answer your question in the next two slides, which will basically help you build those custom dashboards that you care about. That is only focused for your ma management or your CIO or the CTO of the company itself. Yeah, they are. For the marketing manager, correct, yeah. So, so this is for. Uh, this is a great question, and a lot of customers today have the similar question that my marketing managers and they, those who are running the campaigns, they need to see a different view versus what I see as a developer as a different view. So, that comes to basically this. Now, Amazon Redshift is our data warehousing, you know, a petabyte scale data warehousing service. So you can, uh, just a uh, no, few months, uh, two weeks ago, we pre-announced a feature and it's going to be uh, coming, in the, uh, coming this year, is that you, know, you can automatically export all the data that you have collected from your mobile services, uh, from your mobile devices, and export that to Redshift. And then with few lines of code, uh, you can you know, basically run any query that you like that is related to mobile analytics for that particular user. So let's say the CIO wants to not see you know, all the details and the nitty-gritty details, but they want to see a top-level view across all the apps that, that, that across the company. So they can create a simple view that basically you know, you know, helps you mine that data and, and run a simple query that gives you all that data in, in, effectively. So how it works is mobile analytics, you can either see your you know, custom dashboard. And what I see this is most of the companies that are small, they kind of start off with that as a basic metaphor. And then later on when they grow big, they have a lot of data. They, can, they have the you know, data scientist uh, in their, in their term, company. They can you know, mine and do more interesting analysis and big data an analysis to actually you know, do this and more effectively do user segmentation, messaging, all sorts of cool things. So you want to see which users, and I have actually an example here that, that actually talks about this, which is Forza Football. This is one of the largest uh, uh, football uh, uh, in our world we call soccer. Uh, um, uh, in in uh, rest of the world, and it's very very. Uh, they are basically having five million downloads. You know, sending 1.6 billion events a month. You know, 800 million events, um, uh, and um, they are very popular in almost all of Europe and uh, and rest of the world as well. That when when soccer or World Cup comes up, you know, this is the main app to see how um, you know, match analysis and so forth. How how you are interacting with your uh, stuff. So they use uh, our new product, uh, which is the you know, integration. And one of their main tasks was they wanted to segment the users based on their own definition. And user segmentation is a very niche. It's like your, the way I define my segmentation is very different than yours. Uh, because your app is going to perform in a different way. And then the way you want to do it, 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 it really depends on your application itself. So in their case, they defined an, uh, a segment saying who are their low activity users, medium activity users, and high activity users, right? And then what type of uh, you know, features should they prioritize on? 
right? Should they prioritize building features for medium activity users so they become high activity? Or they, they you know, focus on building high activity users so that they increase monetization and revenue? Or they increase conversion or from low activity to medium activity to really you know, add more effectiveness to their app? Because they are a very heavy application. They're, they are much more powerful uh, to do so. So what they did was they integrated with um, Tableau, uh, which is a visualization uh, engine uh, on top of Redshift. And you now, again, once you, once you get this uh, idea, you can basically visualize any way your data across apps, across different data dimensions. So if you want to create a view for, let's say, CIO or a marketing manager, you, know, you can create that view you know, in a custom dashboard with a simple query in Redshift and, and, and visualize that data using visualization tools. So here is an example of that same company. They wanted to see which, which um, um, is the most interesting uh, for um, um, which country is the most interesting when it comes to World Cup, right? You can see, you know, they can mash up two data sets by saying, you know, users per capita for that particular country, right? Uh, the votes that they are getting per, per season uh, on th that they want to manage. So it's, it's pretty cool on that side. They wanted to see device fragmentation. Right? How many people uh, are using you know, Apple iOS versus you know, the different fragmented world of, of uh, Android side? Right? So you can see you know, how you can see not only different view, but really see a great view uh, by, by understanding your user base and then you know, define your preferences as well as your, manage, your, your uh, features and optimize those features based on those. So these are just some examples of visualizations that uh, Forzo was able to create within you know, a day or two uh, by, by integrating that. Um, so I have a demo which I'll skip, but basically it is, it's uh, going through the console and walking through the different parts of the mobile analytics part, uh, which kind of shows you all the details in there. Any questions about mobile analytics? Yes, sir. So you keep mentioning about uh, queries and your custom dashboard, right? Right. So do you like, provide some tools? Like, what type of language is a query about? It's a SQL. Yeah. They, uh, so I didn't cover Redshift as because it's a very big uh, you know, discussion in itself. Uh, but uh, Amazon Redshift is our data warehousing service, which basically you uh, you do multidimensional queries. You can run SQL. You can uh, query the data. You have to manage your schema, everything else. But because you're using Amazon Mobile Analytics, it has a defined schema. So you don't have to do all the different things around designing your schema and so forth. And then because you have a fixed schema, you can define a fixed query around it too. So there are a few examples of that query. And then you, do SQL, you use the SQL bridge basically to, to query the data. And then you can define and do JavaScript or any other visualization tools that you're already using, like Tableau or MicroStrategy or others. Or you define your own open source ones like D3, you know, which is my favorite, that will help you visualize the data in JavaScript in a more effective way. And uh, you make it uh, explicit to the user that you are collecting some data for you. We, I, I didn't understand your question, uh, sorry. You, uh, you need to, uh, some, for some custom events, those kind of thing, you actually like, upload some data from the app to your service, right? Right. So, Right. In your app development side, you can make a, that we are going to store this data for that user. But this is your app, right? So you can define what type of usage analysis data that you are collecting that you want to, you want to show and you want to analyze and learn. So one example that is one of the most prominent example, to, just to answer your question, is you know, around push notifications. Now, how many people have uninstalled the app because there are lots of push notifications coming. Me too, right? So it, it's, it's kind of an art and a science to send how many push, push notifications. And really, number of push notifications can either make or break the app usage model, or you will lose the customer. So what Forzo actually did also here is that it analyzed you know, how many push notifications that particular person is getting and then based on their user segmentation analysis, 
and then data that they are collecting, and then defined you know, their retention analysis as well along with it. So in one graph itself, they would be able to see how many people are actually leaving because of more push notification that they have sent. right? So they, they can do that type of you know, segmentation analysis based on geography, devices, all the different dimensions that they might have you know, to really learn more about their users so they can design their app more effect, more easier way. So yeah, yeah it's, it's up to you. You, de you define how, what data you want to collect, and then you define how you want to visualize that data. Yes, sir. Uh, is there an API for visualization? Yeah. Right. Um, no. So AWS Mobile SDK is more about the mobile, native mobile stuff. While what I was talking about is you know, several partners that today you can use to visualize the data with like Tableau, MicroStrategy, and others that work with our Amazon Redshift database out of the box. Correct. Correct. It's a complete server side. It's it's basically a separate app that you access. You have to have a account with them, but because they have integration with Amazon Redshift, you can you can um, basically get the data that you need uh, uh, on their service. It's a third party service that you could use with Amazon Redshift. So, yes, sir. Great, great question. So the question is, what is the difference? What is the value prop between you know, using Google Analytics versus the, versus this? One is is extremely fast. You get your results in minutes. Second is cost. Uh, this this is practically free. You you have hundred million events in perpetuity per month free that we will, that you don't have to pay to Amazon at all. And um, and then it's one dollar a million events later on. Uh, so, the, so it's extremely cost effective as, uh, and, it, it, and you basically are not paying for any data transfer cost or anything like that in that, in that effective. So, so cost and, and, uh, and, um, and, sp and speed is one of the most important elements. The other part which I like the most is that the ability to use the entire you know, suite of platform of AWS services like Redshift, you know, like uh, RDS database service or DynamoDB service and so forth, and, and a complete ecosystem partners like Tableau and others. So you define and you define the way you like and the relationship that you have, and you have complete flexibility of using whatever service you, you like. And cost is, I think, has been number one because I've seen a lot of customers uh, coming, out, coming from that to, to give us that same feedback that cost is one of the most important elements. So great question. I know I have a hard stop, but I do want to show you Lambda. Uh, so Lambda is one of uh, has now become my favorite service because of the fact that you can run stateless cloud functions without having to worry about um, you know, any servers. You define very simple you know, cloud functions uh, in your device. Uh, sorry, on your on the console, and then and then create a very simple way of of managing your infrastructure. Uh, no, uh, basically by not having to manage the infrastructure. So there are three things to worry about. Uh, three things to know about on, when it comes to Lambda. It's 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 our it's um, uh, running stateless functions in the cloud and scaling without any servers required. Right. You define your simple function, and you define uh, your element that basically says, you know, run this particular function for this much time frame. And you define only one parameter, which is how, much, how many megabytes do you need. Uh, and it will scale on other dimensions of how many servers you need, and so forth. It, it automatically scales. You don't need to worry about load balancers or auto-scaling servers and so forth. It basically is a simple function in itself. And then right now, we added JavaScript support at launch. 
but we can literally basically add any code from Python to, uh, to Java to others later on um, in, coming year, in the coming months, we will add more support. But I'll show you JavaScript because that's my favorite also. Um, and I'll, I'll walk you through a little bit more element. Lambda is not just about mobile, so it is, in, it, of course you can use for mobile um, uh, backend infrastructures, but basically it creates a server-free backend infrastructure for a variety of use cases. Right now it is based on a kind of a data trigger mechanism. So you, trigger, you store your data on let's say Amazon S3 or DynamoDB or our or, 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 or real-time streaming service which is Kinesis. And it will trigger these functions automatically. And I'll show you a simple example here. And then you can do things like, you know, for your Internet of Things, where you want to you know, trigger based on some data changes, or you want to stream processing, or you want to do indexing and synchronization. In my example, I'm going to show you a simple way to create a thumbnail without any server whatsoever. So let's say, you know, have you, how many people have played the game 2048? Few, okay. It's kind of addictive, right? At the end of the game, when you complete, you upload the actual screenshot of your score to Facebook or Google and or somewhere where in your social network that you have completed the game itself, right? So that's what I had in my kind of snake game. So you can see here, you know, I have an upload screen. So my my uh, my high level, my score, my last record. This is my data. I upload this screenshot, and I wanted to create a thumbnail automatically on the server side. And when, let's say, thousands of devices are running, I don't have to worry about auto scaling the servers, creating thumbnails, running image magic servers, and so forth. So I will create a cloud function in this case. So what it does is let's just go directly to AWS Lambda. So yeah, Lambda is one of the uh, it's currently in preview. So not, not many people have access to this, but still you can de definitely take a look at this. So I created a simple function called create lambda function. I'll show you what I did. Okay. Oh, Wi-Fi again, damn it. Mm -hmm. It's all on GitHub. I can send you a link later. I, I, can, I have a link, I think, in the last slide of mine. So, damn, I don't have a connection, sorry. I think I have to turn off and on every time. <laughs> okay, let's see it works. Okay. Works. So I create a function. In this case, you know, I want to create a thumbnail. So I will say you know, S3 thumbnail. So I want, at, 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 whenever you create, whenever I upload any image to my server directly from my device to an S3 bucket, um, I want to automatically call that fun cloud function and then you know, let the cloud function run and create the thumbnail and then store back the thumbnail back into the same same uh, folder itself. So in this case, you can see in light, right in the console itself, I can create S3 trigger. And I can write some description. And here you can specify basically the entire code that you need in JavaScript that, that, that will you know, take the server, take the code, and, and do the thumbnail and pick up that particular uh, you know, S3 um, the, the thumbnail that, sorry, that image that I had uploaded and then do the code as well. So in this case, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to, because the internet connection is sort of flaky a bit, I'm going to go back to my function, which is the S3 resizer that I created. And this is the function. So let's just go and see the, the function and the, actually not the event source. I want to manually test this. This is a great way to kind of show the element as well. So what my code is doing here. So you can see I'm using the AWS SDK, um, JavaScript SDK. I'm using the ImageMagic SDK uh, library also. And in this particular JavaScript code, I'm looking at the bucket, um, bucket name. 
and then I'm going to basically you know, call resize on the function, which is resize parameters. So I'm going to just basically take that image and resize that. And this is a console element where, uh, where I, can, I can specify and I can test and kind of invoke the elements uh, without having to send any events. Uh, but since I have I've already created this event, I, I mean function, I, I have defined right, the right roles in there. So the roles is basically saying that I have created an S3 function. This, whenever any object is this in S3, based on the invocation role, you know, call this uh, lambda function. Or you can have multiple lambda functions as well, on a, on based on that particular trigger that is happening. In this case, the trigger is uh, upload an object to S3. It could be anything, change in DynamoDB. It could be uh, S3, it could be anything. So. Uh, but I can I, I invoke that particular cloud function, and then in the cloud function in the lambda interface that I define, I have to say what my what is my execution role? An execution role defines saying no this particular role this particular function has access to S3 uh, to fetch and put the data back in there. So I define those two roles ahead ahead and up front. And I can invoke it and, and kind of you know, do the, uh, test it out itself. So let me kind of show you in a simple you know, view. I'm going to use the traditional viewer called the S3 organizer. And in my snake game, I had added a, a simple view uh, that you know, with add a screenshot as well as the timestamp. And I'm going to try this if this works. So I'm, yeah, it's now it's uploading to S3. So it's going to take this screenshot that I just uh, took, right? And then it's going to keep that. I'm just going to refresh this. And there you go. I have this particular file, that PNG file that I had, uh, no, this screenshot that I, I just uploaded. Um, um, that is basically the, the last screenshot. And then I, if, I, if I hit refresh, Again, or this is just again this particular client, but within few seconds, I was able to create the thumbnail of that particular view as well. So what did this do is it immediately saw the trigger that happened due to S3, uh, the S3 put, in the, and, and it triggered that Lambda function. It created the thumbnail and stored that thumbnail back into that bucket without any server actually running that I have to manage. All running scalably, auto scalable, without having to worry about load balancers or servers. So this is, I think, the new paradigm of of cloud computing, where you are defining basic cloud functions in the cloud. You know, cloud functions run for in any language. In this case, right now, JavaScript, uh, but it's very atomic in nature. And then you can, you know, you can you know, define elements. Now, the one thing which I didn't uh, you know, cover was these advanced settings. So here you are defining every single cloud function has a limit and a timeout of 60 seconds. So your function has to run within 60 seconds. And you can define how much processing power it needs by basically just one parameter, which is they are megabytes. So how much megabyte uh, access you need, right? And this defines the CPU, this defines the other parameter also. So you can define all these you know, in, in in this without having to worry about servers, instances, load balancers, you know, spinning up servers and shutting down servers and so forth, all handled, managed by the Lambda service. Any questions? Yes, sir. So in Lambda can only be written in JavaScript? Right now, as on launch, because it just launched last week, it is JavaScript support. So all of JavaScript functions, Node.js, all of that will work. But in future, we are, uh, we are going to soon add Python, Java, all the other. It's basically a container. So you are, you are spinning up containers in a very effective way and then and, and, uh, no, starting and stopping quickly. But it's just a script, right? It's a script. You cannot add, like in Java, you can add class libraries and all that. So you would be able to add all of that. You can add, in this case, as I showed you example, you are adding the image magic, which is pretty large. You know, image magic JavaScript library. So you are just adding that library and you are bundling up that and storing that into a zip and uploading that zip. So it runs that zip into that in, in that particular environment. Question? Yeah, I was just wondering, 
was no, looking at the pricing and, you know, and when you had it on the screen as well, they had mentioned something about the amount of memory. Like right. Right. Or also the process that it kicks off. So like for example, if you had something like you had an S3 trigger that would start up an EMR job, but then just the starting up of the EMR job would be the end of the Lambda execution. Uh, actually it will be the other way. The starting of the trigger would be that you have an S you have a Lambda function which will actually launch the trigger, launch the EMR cluster. So there will be a function that will be just for Lambda to launch the cluster. And then once your results are being pushed, you know, it, that you have, that they were computed using your mappers and reducers on your EMR side, they go into S3, and then again a trigger is fun called through Lambda that maybe does, like, show your report. So you can have multiple functions that way. Okay, but the, I'm at, what I guess I didn't ask very well is that... The pricing side I didn't understand. The, Just for that particular function. It's not the EMR job. Right. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just the time of that particular function the job runs. If it runs and it, it basically is not looking at anything, so your, your function needs to be very defined and very if, um, no, stateless in a way that it's not waiting for too long. Right. Yes, sir. Yeah, exactly. That's a great, great question. Actually, in the console itself, if I can, if the UI works, um, this has complete control over um, our CloudWatch metrics. So you can see uh, CloudWatch. So you're seeing request duration, request count, execution, environment. And then when you go to uh, Amazon, where is it? CloudWatch, which is our monitoring service, which basically gives you complete access to what, how, how you're performing, what your, how does your memory usage. So you can optimize saying that, okay, it was not good for 128. I want to make sure that I want to do it for 256. And then you optimize that and, and test it out in your way. So it defines in this uh, logging framework. And right now I don't have this set up. This, oh, there it is, sorry. So it kind of shows you the log streams and actually shows you when this function was, whether it ended, it timed out, or so, and what level of functionality that you need for what level of memory you need, you will need to uh, to execute this in this one line. So let me, in the interest of time, and the security team kind of uh, you know, kicking us out here. Um, I will also kind of focus on, so that was Lambda, basically. Lambda is a way to kind of, yes sir, question. Are there sample Lambdas that you guys have either put out there for us to look at or that actually are just waiting for us to use uh, out of the box? Um, right now, uh, the documentation has a lot of different examples, like the one that I showed, like thumbnail. Uh, but uh, you are open, we are, we are trying to learn a little bit more as we go along as well, so how customers are using it. And some of the customers have already uh, uploaded their own cloud functions, uh, so we are looking at how we can make it easier for the customers, but right now it's just like cutting and pasting from their blog to our console. But that's the intent that we would like to know how customers use it, and then we'll re you know, kind of make it more easier and uh, for them to reuse it. Um, so last but not the least is uh, Amazon S3. And actually, let me just skip through this one. This is one of the most powerful ways to build a media app. And um, no, for, for, for my game demo, what I did was I wanted to store all the game assets in the cloud and dynamically download all the game assets. So if I go back to my game, and I, let's say, you now kill it, and then I go back. Actually, I need to log out. So I did, like, let's say I go with Amazon this time. And I, for, for the people, uh, for, for we, when I log in with Amazon, I want, um, to do something more interesting. For example, no, download the new game assets, 
uh, or download the game assets for this new particular device. This is a you know, five inch phone, but on my tablet it is a seven inch phone. So there is a different type of a game assets, so different HDPI, different uh, sen uh, screen densities and, uh, and different graphics that I would like to download on demand. And whenever you download any game or play any game, you will see that you know, progress bar that says, basically it's downloading the game assets on demand. So uh, that or even interesting things like you know, Christmas is coming up or FIFA World Cup is coming up and you want to st give your game uh, the same theme but a different uh, you know, uh, game asset. So in this case, I was, um, um, I, with, with the Amazon login, I, I created a way to saying, okay, go download these new game assets dynamically from S3, you know, and completely change the game uh, uh, graphics without me telling, so I can create a, you know, a new version. And this is my FIFA theme of the snake game. Um, doing the exact same thing, but instead of the apple, it's the FIFA ball, as you can see over here. And it has a powerful theme. As you can see, my game graphics are not that pretty, but still. Um, um, uh, so this is basically dynamically creating game assets, or downloading game assets from S3, again, without having to worry about servers. It's burning Amazon servers. It's burning Amazon servers and not, not no, your servers that you are running uh, for any of these games and game environments. So I'll skip a few slides. I'll make all these slides available so you know it's pretty easy to integrate uh, with the SDK that you know, transfer manager upload transfer manager dot download. It does all the things that you need uh, when you're working in a cloud setup where you know you have to do multiple retries in a distributed setup. It does multi-part upload, multi-part download. It resumes uploads all you know, works with intermittent connectivity, all with the uh, with the SDK itself. So you can. Um, yeah, you can uh, uh, do that too. And last, let me quickly cover uh, push notification. And this is one of the most important elements of engaging your users. Um, so when you're working with multiple app, dev app applications and you're having Apple uh, iOS dev uh, apps as well as Android or uh, Windows applications, you, know, you have to work with multiple different providers uh, and, and work with different API uh, to actually do push notification and use their gateways to it. And so push notification service is an intermediary service that works in a single endpoint and then allows you to manage the entire you know, uh, push notification gateway within just a few lines of code. So whether you are using APNS, Google GCM, or Windows and others, or you are having an app in China for Chinese developers where there is no single app store, there are hundreds and thousands of app stores. Uh, so so you, want to, you want to reach that particular audience in a more effective way to engage your users also in a more effective way. So what SNS does is really that it creates an easier way for you to to manage these tokens and manage these uh, you know, registration for push notifications. Um, so one of the one of my favorite customer here is Path. How many people know about Path? Oh, not many. Path is, I think, uh, one of the fastest growing um, you know, messaging apps, just like a social networking app. Um, they have um, you know, five million daily active users. One of the you know, Silicon Valley you know, favorites, uh, I would say. Um, they were managing a fleet of servers just for push notifications because they have to, you know, they are completely relying. It's like WhatsApp in some ways for your small little family. Um, and they're managing load balancers, they are managing servers. And then just one fine day you know, in the month of August, or I think September, no, what was it? September or so, they, they decided to move to SNS. And then they were able to, now move from zero to 500 million push notifications in a matter of three days. And that's why I was mentioning earlier that scale is important, but velocity of scale is extremely important too. And by using these highly scalable, highly distributed you know, you know, services, that it, 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 it gives you the power that you, so that you can focus more on what you do the best rather than worrying about you know, no, no, scale and other elements that are there, whether it's synchronization or push 
you know, or analytics, it basically gives you that power across different devices, across different platforms, uh, development platforms. So uh, that was basically, let me skip uh, DynamoDB, but I'll make all these slides available to you to, to store all the data as well. But basically the idea here is that your basic table stakes environment, right? Building, authorizing, authenticating application uh, users, analytics that you have, or, or you're storing or delivering media to your mobile app. You don't want to manage a lot of server backend infrastructure. You want to build serverless, serverless apps that, that inherently scale. Uh, and, and, and also so that you can you know, reach you know, not just Android and other users, but also you know, the web component as well, where you can have a bridge your web and mobile world together. Um, so so um, uh, there are a few examples here. Just to end, just to end is that you know, uh, this complete suite of AWS services is designed from, from the ground up to be cross-platform, to, to basically you know, provide you that, that single you know, drop or an uh, a SDK native to Android environment that will help you kind of quickly get started and then scale later on for when you reach lots of users uh, to it. So three big takeaways. Now, whether you're using a, a, you know, a Google or Facebook or Amazon or any other login provider, no, you have a login provider of choice. You have a login provider of any services that you that you have. No, it's cross-platform and it's optimized for mobile, and it's designed for the next generation of Internet of Things as well, to some extent. And then, <clears throat> fully integrated, works natively, and extremely easy to get started with just few lines of code. You can you can quickly get you know, to where you want. Um, and then literally later on change things like conflict resolution, add more complexity later on as you move along. So you need that flexibility as well as you need that scale together to build that out. So um, on the pricing side, I, I didn't cover that, but literally these services are practically free. Uh, no, there is uh, the first you know, free tier, so we, there is no charge for data transfer. You know, identity services, basically, and there is no charge at all. Uh, but but from a cognito side, number of syncs you get one million sync a month for free, and then um, and then ten gigabytes of storage on Amazon Cognito free. Now hundred million events per month is free, and then it's one a dollar a minute uh, and, um, per million events, and then one million of push notification messages every month free for the user. So until you you actually use uh, reach a certain user base, you're practically not you know paying a dime to Amazon. But when you are having more users and you are, you are, you are, you are understanding your new users and you, you, are, you are paying as you go as you, as you use these particular services. So again, thank you very much for listening. I hope I covered all the aspects here, but feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. I'll be around until they allow me here. Uh, but uh, thank you very much. And this is the first um, East Side Android Meetup. So keep the community growing, and I will really um, encourage everybody to cross pollinate and learn among each other. And uh, and also, this is a great way to also uh, no, uh, learn about different technologies too. So thank you very very much. <laughs>